is what I want to discuss now, the chronophobia of our creation. The suggestion by our friend Setterfield is that at the time of creation, the speed of light was 200 billion times faster than now. So when God said, let there be light, that speed of light was 200 billion times faster than now. The suggestion by Setterfield is that light stopped slowing down in 1960. Setterfield also argues that the speed of light started to slow down at the first sin. So that means that from 1960 onward we had no sin. Did you notice? <laughs> That's the implication of this time. Let us now look at a very simple equation. Einstein's equation, which most of you would learn from comic books or television. E equals mc squared, where c equals the speed of light. So that means the energy, when we're using c squared, the energy at the time of creation was 40 billion, 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 billion times greater than any similar process today. So if Adam lovingly lit a fire for Eve, the energy given out in that fire is equivalent to a 50 megaton bomb. <laughs> that is science. Adam and Eve had three children. The very act of procreation involves a release of energy. The act of procreation for those three children would have released energy equivalent to an explosion of 500 tons of TNT. <laughs> That's the origin of the expression that the earth moved for you all. <laughs> That's the fact. If we have the speed of light 200 billion times faster than now, and we could see things, then the only form light could have been in would have been as high energy gamma radiation. Radiation sickness within minutes, death within hours. So that is the sort of science we are confronted with when our creationist friends want to change the facts. Something I want to talk about later, when they want to change a fundamental, like the speed of sun, a speed of light. You look at the implications of it and it is ridiculous. But that's what it is. The second law of thermodynamics. Tonight I got very frightened to learn the universe was running down. I really think that once you know the universe is running down, you should join up. That's the aim of the extra. <laughs> but the second law of thermodynamics is an interesting argument that is always used. I heard exactly the same argument on Wednesday by Dr. Gish. It was just cranking the same handle. First, we start with the second law of thermodynamics. We say it's a closed system, and we go from the simple to the complex, or from the ordered to the difficult. And then, after the handle's been cranked five times, it was four today, so you're doing well, after it's cranked four or five times, suddenly the open system slips in. And immediately, we hear nothing about equilibrium, and we hear nothing about the open system. So if we use his arguments, and he's very clear on chicken, so let's use one, we start with an egg. It is a closed system. You put a bit of energy on it and keep it like that for a little while and the egg becomes a chicken. So that's the exact opposite of what he's saying. So the first criticism of his second law of thermodynamics is that he omits to tell you two fundamentals. He makes an assumption that the universe is at equilibrium. He also makes the assumption that the universe is a closed system. That would be nice to know if it was or if it was not. We also heard this, I heard from you on Wednesday, how when we have the second law of thermodynamics operating, everything's running down and please join up and pay your money because the, the, the world is ending quickly. And we heard a magnificent statement about wearing out molecules. 
I would like to know how you can wear out an oxygen molecule. How do you do it? Do you rub a few electrons off on the outside or do you selectively plug out a few protons? That's what we're getting to. We have a number of red herrings which we are continually fed. Most are because there is no attempt made to get to the source. I was bewildered to hear about Nebraska Man tonight. Nebraska Man was first published in the Illustrated London News of December the 17th, which you know is Beethoven's birthday, of 1927, and the reputation of it was by the scientists who found it, and the reputation was in a scientific journal. So it's like the Daily Mirror publishing something and calling it science, and later the scientists refuted it. But that is quoted to us as gospel. We hear also the evolution from hydrogen to people. Did we hear anything about nuclear fusion? No. So we are always not given the complete story, and if we go back to the source, we have a few problems. We heard a probability argument, an absolutely improbable situation existed. Well, I've done the same. And we can have a probability argument using the 26 letters of the alphabet and 120 combinations of them. And I'll read you the start of what it says. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we go. If we look at any probability, we can randomly, quite easily, pick a combination of 26 letters of the alphabet to throw them together. You can do it with the Kabul phone book and you can get a unique Situation. You can do it with anything. That is the sort of argument we get fed. What I want to now talk about are some of our scientific publications which come from our creations. The creationists will not allow reputation by science. They will not allow a process of improving of correction. I use the same principle. And I used our friend's book, or booklet, it's more like a comic, which was called, Are You Being Brainwashed? I go to page eight. There is a diagram there that says, Pre-Cambrian, void of fossil. That is a lie. The Pre-Cambrian is not void of fossils. The pre-Cambrian is extremely rich in fossils. He has come to the country where there are many pre-Cambrian fossils going back to 3,300 million years ago. On the same diagram, he says the Earth's crust is void of fossils. That is a lie. Every fossil found on this planet is from the Earth's crust. That is from his book, Are You Being Brainwashed? Page 8. <laughs> we also see on the same page the Cambrian, a geological time period of some time ago. And I quote, the billions of fossils found are all of highly complex forms of life. That is a lie. So on one simple diagram we have three lies. That is their scientific publication. We turn over to page 9 and we read, not a single indisputable multicellular fossil has been found anywhere in the world in a rock supposedly older than Cambrian rocks. That is a lie. But what we get is the repetition of these lies all the time. You don't find fossils in old rocks, you don't find fossils in old rocks, you don't find fossils in old rocks, and eventually someone believes it. So, we've had two and a bit pages, and we've got ourselves four lives. Now, we have an interesting situation here, because one of the Australian creationists, Andrew Snelling, and I quote, he says, Pre-Cambrian rocks are either rich in fossils, or they commonly contain abundant organic matter, which is the remains of fossils. The question is, which creationist is lying? There is no choice. 
Continue with page nine. Billions of highly complex animals just suddenly appear with no signs of gradual development from lower forms. That is a lie. So we have now had 55 words and five lies. One lie every 11 words in his publication. I asked him, how can the fossil record be so cruel to creation? And the answer is, you fabricate, you ignore, you say it doesn't exist. Now we've had it five times in two pages. Second law of thermodynamics, I counted it on Wednesday 32 times in 50 minutes. So you just crank the handle, the same stuff coming out all the time. Okay, now let's...